The following is a presentation of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Genesis uh, 1, 26 and following. And God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the surface of all the earth. Every tree which is fruit yielding seed it should be food for you. And every beast of the earth, every bird of the sky, to everything that moves on the earth, which has life, I've given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made. Behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And then in chapter 2, we'll start with verse 18. And the Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. He slept, then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife naked and were not ashamed. Thus far God's word. Let's pray. A holy and triune God, we bless your name, for indeed you are great, there's none like you in the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them. And yet, Lord, you made man in your image and entrusted to him the um, rule over this glorious creation of yours. Rule it under you for your glory and your honor, because we are your image. But Lord, we also recognize that in our rebellion, we sought to overthrow your rule over our lives and corrupted our rule. But we thank you for Christ, our Redeemer, who came to restore us to your image as sons and daughters, and to restore to us our responsibilities as redeemed image bearers. Well, we're going to discuss many important truths tonight, and we confess that when we deal with the word, that we uh, need the illuminating work of your spirit. We pray you'll give us insight and wisdom and attention, Lord, of the great truths that we will consider tonight. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, last week, we got in, finished up with the Trinity and what God is with respect to his creation and the decree of God. Remember that great quotation from Gregory Nazianzus uh, picked up in Calvin um, with respect to the, uh, the, the Trinity. I cannot think of the one without quickly being encircled by the splendor of the three, nor can I discern the three that be straightway carried back to the one. So in the Trinity, the three persons are equal uh, to substance, power, and glory, and as such, no subordination in their personal properties. What are the personal properties of the Trinity? Ethan? I mean, uh, Jonathan? It belongs the Son, the begotten, our Father, and to the Holy Spirit, received from the Father and the Son. So, but what are the properties then? 
Hello. Do you have a guest? Alex? Alex Sawyer. Great. Here's another chair. You can sit right up here. You can move back. <laughs> So DNT received or what? The beginning and the percent and the DNT. Not deity. Okay, not deity. We hold the aseity, which means the self-existence of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So we reject the traditional that the Son is eternally begotten in his deity, but really in his person, he's eternally Son, and the Spirit is eternally Spirit. So the Son's begotten. So he receives his personal property of son, the father's personal property is father, and the spirit is spirit. Uh, as such, they have roles in the, what we call the economic trinity, the working of the Godhead. The father is first. You can think of the father decreeing all the river in every act of the trinity. All three persons are active. The father is the planner, the son is the accomplisher, and the spirit is the perfecter. That's one way to relationships. We look at the decree of God. What is the decree of God? <coughs> All right, that's good. Give me catechism answer. Where did catechism seven? Are you going to promise? What are the decrees of God? The decrees of God are His. According to the counsel of his, for his own. Okay. So it's the eternal uh, purpose of God that he has done from eternity, and it's for his own glory, and he is foreordained all that comes to pass. And when we apply that decree to uh, moral creatures, uh, how do we break it down? What do we call it? decree itself. That's how you execute the decrees. What do we call the decree when we, it deals with moral creatures, men and angels? Election and reprobation. reprobation. An election is what? God seeing who wanted to be saved and choosing them. Choosing who to say according to his own good pleasure for his own glory and reprobation. What are two parts of reprobation? Federation. Somebody said federation. What is federation? Passing by. Passing by. So it's God's determining from eternity. I'm not going to bestow grace on do, 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 individuals. Then condemning them to hell because he passed them by. Because of their sin. All right. So election, and then Dr. Smith and others say that the, the standards deliberately use election and predestination for the positive, and always use coordination for reprobation, simply to make that uh, distinction. How does God execute His decrees? All right, so we started in creation, then last week as well. And which person of the Godhead created? All, all right. So it's the work of the triune God. Uh, what's the purpose of creation? For the glory of his three things. All right, power, wisdom, and goodness. We know that natural man uh, sees those things in God's revelation, we saw back in chapter 1, uh, and is thus suppresses the truth and is accountable then for that deliberate rebellion. But it's also a relation to us that we should enjoy the created handiwork of God, uh, its beauty, its splendor. Be reminded that our God, in fact, is powerful wise and good from all eternity, and then to love him for the beauty we see in his work as a creator. 
What does the term in the beginning express in Genesis 1-1? Right, God created time. And what the means by which God created? The word of his power. What does ex nihilo mean with respect to creation? So what part was nothing? Everything under on time. Hmm? Everything from what God kept. So so then but but it says that he made man from the dust of the ground. How's that ex nihilo? He created the first stuff of creation. Okay. And then out of that. The first thing he did was make everything from which he was going to make everything else. So Genesis 1 1 is creation and ex nihilo. Genesis 1 2 is the product of that initial powerful created act of God. Then secondary creation is about shaping, forming, dividing out of that original mass. And you can actually see the, the logical unfolding of Genesis 1. If you really understand uh, 1 2, that the um, earth was uninhabitable, uninhabited, and a watery mass. So, what's the first thing that we could call it a created defect? What's the first created defect that God addresses? Huh? Well, he made the stuff. What did he make before he made the heavens? Nothing. Huh? No, we've already got to pass that. What's the first day of creation? Light. After light. light. All right, you got this problem. You got this dark, watery mass. The first thing he does is create light. All the while, the Holy Spirit's doing what? Preserving, protecting, and generating at the commandment of God the Son. Then you will go through the steps. Days one through three, he makes the earth habitable. From uh, uh, separating the waters, dividing the waters from dry land, putting plants on the waters. Uh, and so he's created a place. And then uh, four through six, uh, the inhabitants. So the heavenly bodies, uh, the um, uh, animals, fish, and birds and then man. So you see how this is moving um, according to those things as spelled out in Genesis 1 verse 2. There's an order there, which is one of the reasons that we uh, want to stick to the order of Genesis 1 and not say it was some analogical or poetic arrangement. What is it? You still here? <laughs> Mr. Johnson. I'm going to be here until No, I'm teaching you. Go ahead. and then we will actually talk about that. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. That's good. Okay. Thank you. What does the standards mean by the space of six days? Even my good friend Chad Van Dixhorn says all they're doing is taking a phrase out of Scripture. Duration? Did he say duration? Is it a space of six days? Challenge y'all to get a concordance and look that up. Is that phrase in the Bible? It is not. It's not in the Bible. Um, it is coined by Calvin in the commentary of Genesis and Archbishop Usher, whose writings were kind of the blueprint for the catechism at the Westminster Assembly. And it was over against Augustine's view that God created a nanosecond. And uh, what is being asserted is that God created through a duration, but it was a six day duration. Now, some of the divines wanted to say six 24 hour days. They resisted that because we don't know the exact length of a day uh, pre solar. We don't even know the exact length of a day post solar pre fall. But the Holy Spirit would want us to think about a common day. And we ought to think about creation was made in six common days and not try to, you know, 18 hours, 25 hours, whatever, but six common days, not some immediacy and not some uh, lengthy period of 
So that's where we ended uh, last week. It's all very good. So tonight we want to pick up then with the creation of man. And so I you know, actually meant to print something. Um, so by for our guest, we forgot about doing that. Um, I can do it really quickly. It'd be nice for you all to have that. So I need. All right, so we're going to, uh, we're in chapter 4, paragraph 2, there we go. After God had made all of the creatures, created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image, having all God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet under a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Beside this law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for which while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and dominion over the creatures. A very brief summary of that is short of Catechism 10. God created man, male, and female after his own image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures. The larger Catechism uh, adds a bit, it's important. After God had created all of the creatures, created man, male, and female, here's the part, form the body of man of the dust of ground and woman of the rib of the man, endued them with living and reasonable and immortal souls made them after his own image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, having the law of God within their hearts and power to fulfill it and dominion over the creatures yet subject to fault. So we see here that man is the climax, the high point of creation. And we see that in the order of Genesis. We see that as well in how God introduced the creation. Come on in, brother. You got your own chair? Sit right up here and be the chief's pet. <laughs> are you leaving tomorrow? Yeah. So we are at um, chapter 4, paragraph 2. We also see it in the way that uh, God introduced this. So the other thing God asked was God said, let there be, and there was. But now God said, let us. Make man in our image. So the very language is not that God just now is trying to do this, but the language is reflecting God's own purpose, not just in the creation of man, but the place of man in the entirety of creation. Everything has been moving to this climax. So the inhabitable uh, earth has been made habitable, all the other inhabitants are there. Now man, who is to govern this earth under God, is created. Uh, the larger uh, the confession says he made them male and female. The larger catechism reminds us of how God created them. So he formed the body of man of the dust of the ground, Genesis 2. And so again, it's not the word that's used there is the word of a potter, but it's, it's, it's anthropomorphic language. It's God uh, showing that by his word, he caused the dust cleaved together into the form of Adam, the male uh, member of the species, and then he breathed into him a soul, which made him uh, distinct then from all other <coughs> of the creatures. Now they're all called, uh, all have living souls, but the word he breathed into him is spirit, the breath of life. And so whereas an animal's animation comes purely out of its neurological system, uh, a man's animation comes out of the fact that he's got this uh, spiritual uh, element still in him, which we'll come back to. But then he made Eve, how? From the rib of Adam. By the way, the rib is the only bone in your body that will replenish itself. 
interesting. That's what God did in creation and left that one scientific fact around for us to uh, <coughs> be able to look back at. Yeah. So whenever the Catechism and the, the Confession talks about man's made in righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. I'm not man. I'm talking about their creation right now, their origin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's okay. So, why did not God make Eve from the dust of the ground? some kind of uh, headship or Adam. okay there's no confused derivative and headship so uh, that's why the scripture says he made them male and female uh, after his image but there is in the very order of creation uh, and it's Paul that teaches us this uh, the relationship of man to woman not in any inferiority but in terms of authority structure just as in the Trinity we saw there's no inferiority, there is a voluntary subordination. And so that's, but there's another even more important reason. They're one flesh. Okay, they're going to become one flesh. Is that in the New Testament where uh, Paul says uh, that man is made after the image of God, but woman is made after the image of man? No. I thought you'd get that right. <laughs> Did you enjoy Saturday night? Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 guys have said it true, except I think that what Paul is doing with a woman, the image of man, is not saying that she's not the image of God, but again, talking about this authority structure. Well, why is that? Why couldn't God establish Adam as the covenant head of Eve if he had made Eve from the dust? Because part of the covenant headship is tied into the genealogical, so it's a biological aspect. Yes, you can't separate it. There's all kinds of, quote, reformed uh, things going on now that uh, Adam and Eve were the two hominids from which God made, uh, came from two hominids. Another one is that uh, there was just a great race of people that were the king and the queen. Ah, bring a chair if you want to come. <laughs> Get you a chair from next door. Somebody get him a chair, please. He's rushed in from work. We should have our seat. He has permission to be late. See this didn't. <laughs> and what we're going to do, Zach, we're going to take our break and you have to go. That is very kind of you, Dr. Fine. I appreciate it. Well, it happens to be right on the calendar, so, but anyway. <laughs> this far. All right, so that's one question. Now, um, how do we apply the confession and the scriptures here to gender issues? going on today with gender issues? In what closet are you living in?
female and female are more <laughs> uh, role issues, really. So, but I can see the question was ambiguous. So, in terms of modern discussions, does this speak anything to uh, transgender issues? So there are two sexes, and they are distinct physically, they're distinct um, biologically, and God made them male and female. And uh, here we have the Creator's blueprint spelled out for us in Scripture, and also um, repeated then in our confession. So it's very important that we remain uh, uh, compassionate and firm on this. A person does not decide his or her gender. That has been appointed by God in creation and in providence. Yes. What would you say to those people that affirm that there are two sexes but say that gender is different than sex and is fluid? Well, I'm just saying I don't find nothing in the Bible to, uh, to say that gender is related to sex. So that Anatomy is sexually a woman, you're a woman, and that's how God created you uh, and in providence formed you in your mother's womb. Abram. Moses gave him the command Say again? What would you say on the exception of Pilatus? Right, I was hoping somebody asked that question. Uh, because of the fall, there are irregularities. Uh, in terms of uh, rare, uh, but at that point, I think that's where you get it. Uh, chromosomal uh, issues, and you'll have a surgery one way or the other. And we don't prove uh, exceptions as rules, we prove rules by exceptions. All right, so then. Uh, with this reasonable immortal soul, we have what theologians will call the broader aspect of the image of God expressed in confession, reasonable immortal souls uh, in the larger catechism, living reasonable and immortal souls. So all people, because they have a soul, have then intelligence, uh, will, and affections, have a moral compass. That is just part of having a soul, which is the broader part of being the image of God. But the, um, the Westminster divines prefer to talk about the narrow image when they say, after uh, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, after his own image, or as the uh, Catechism says, made them after his own image and knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. We get those three categories from Paul in Colossians 3, 10, Ephesians 4, 24, where he shows us that in Christ we're being renewed uh, to the form that, in which we were created. So, uh, knowledge, righteousness, and holiness is what Adam had as the first prophet, priest, and king. And he had um, a knowledge of God's will. It goes on to say that he had the law written in his heart. So he had a... Um, an inbuilt knowledge of God's law, um, and then he had verbal revelation as well, at least with respect to the Sabbath work and marriage, and we don't know what other things God reiterated uh, with him. Uh, and then he had a special uh, commandment with respect to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He understood these things. He understood the creation so that he could uh, intuitively uh, look at an animal and name it according to its nature. Uh, he had uh, righteousness, which means he was in communion with God. As a priest, he was in right standing with God. Holiness, he was the king. He was separate from the rest of the creation, separated unto God to serve him, and thus he was over everything else. So the broader image was defaced but not lost. So it's clear from Genesis 9, isn't it, that, that 
All people are the image of God. That's why murder is wrong. That's why abortion uh, is wrong. Um, but these three things were lost uh, by God's appointment as we get to the fall. We'll see more with respect to uh, that. So he had a moral nature. He then was put on probation. He had a full moral revelation of God on his heart and whatever God revealed to him. And then he had a positive law uh, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A positive law is a law given by God which to violate is sin, but it is only a reflection of God's will. Thus it's positive, not his nature. That's why a positive law can change. A moral law is a reflection of God's nature. It is unchangeable. But the positive law, and so this is why we see ceremonial laws, judicial laws, these things are changed, fulfilled uh, in Christ. Um, so the tree of knowledge of good and evil was the probationary law, the great test as we come to the covenant of works uh, later. Uh, but here we just point out that he had a command not to eat of that tree. And then they lived in communion with God. So we see in Genesis 2 that God came in the cool of the evening uh, and um, walked with them in the, uh, in the garden. And then there's the emphasis here in all three, confession and catechism said he had dominion over creatures. So that uh, under God, uh, Adam and Eve had the responsibility then to, uh, to guard the garden spiritually to care for it physically, to cultivate it, uh, and to subdue it, exercising the role of the first scientists and, and fighters and whatever, as they would <laughs> seek to um, shape this garden in the way that God allowed them to do it. Could you give us your, uh, your definition of positive law? Positive law is a law that is an expression of God's will, but not his nature. So the Sabbath, on the seventh day, it would have been a sin to break that. Now the Sabbath on the first day, the moral principle is 27. The positive law expresses which day. Uh, this tree, there's no longer any tree that you and I are forbidden to eat of. We don't know what kind of tree it was. There was nothing about the tree inherently natural or moral. It was purely a test of man. God expressed it. I use the analogy of parents. So some of you have uh, little children and you have specific uh, rules for little children. They can't can't go out in the front yard, they can't go out in the street, they gotta go to sleep, whatever it's seven, eight o'clock, whatever the rules are. Now as the children get older, and for a child not to obey is what? Sin. It's a sin. But now you don't tell your six year old not to go out in the front yard or across the street, do you? Or to go to bed at six or seven o'clock at night. Uh, the laws change according to your administration as a wise parent. And so a lot of God's positive laws simply change for us as we grow uh, in the history of, of redemption and as well as, uh, as Christians. So for example, take the fifth commandment. Paul changes the language of the fifth commandment. It's no longer tied to the land, uh, but you'll prosper and have a long life. Uh, there, the land has been fulfilled, and now Paul takes the principle out of that and shows how the promise is so different. And in each of the Ten Commandments, you're going to find these uh, expressions uh, that uh, would have limited the way the children of Israel would have kept this commandment in the way that we would keep the commandment in this respective ceremonial law. So, for example, if you want to wear, um, I don't know anybody would, but or polyester, you're free to do so. Uh, it wouldn't be a sin. It wouldn't be a sin to them. Uh, you can eat pork. So we were talking about barbecue a while ago. <laughs> and I'm so glad <laughs> that we can eat pork. It's better than brisket. So. Uh, but uh, it, it was a sin. It wasn't just an uncleanness. It was a sin to eat meat, God forbid. 
But he, he was training his people that they had to live by his word, not, not by bread alone. What is being called positive? It gets back to philosophical. It, it's positive, it means it's, a, it's an act of God's will. Yeah. So it's not that the, the thing you forbid is bad, it, it's actually about the difference between God and God. Right. Moral law is a reflection of God's nature and our relationship to Him and one another. It's part of who we are. It's inspired to God. So we're making a hard distinction between a will and a law. His will. Not a hard distinction. His will is not changing it. His will, His revealed will for behavior as people does change. In those regards, not if it's any expression. So any of the moral principles of the Ten Commandments, they don't change. <coughs> but we no longer worship God in the temple by sacrifices. That's not how we keep the Second Commandment. And we don't uh, worship on the seventh day, worship on the first day, those types of things. The civil law can end up, um, there are multiple laws that are being temporized that are just a positive law. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about them when we get to the law. But you can actually, uh, there's a nice uh, statement in the uh, Confession of Faith on the Sabbath. Just trying to get there in this book. Is it for the first time? Worship and the Sabbath. Okay, uh, it's uh, 21. Okay, and paragraph 7. As it is the law of nature that in general a due proportion of time be set apart for the worship of God, so that is, that's written on our hearts, our conscience. Um, so in his word, by a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment binding all men in all ages, he has particularly appointed one day in seven. So the positive part of this has to do with the, the day and, and, and a whole day is to be set aside. Uh, the first day and the seventh day. The moral part is the core that we must keep one day separate from the other six days, holy under the Lord. The perpetual part of it doesn't change until the end of the age. Yeah. Uh, how does positive law change holy in continuation? Which positive law? I mean, I'm thinking of the That's a good question. Uh, I think scripture helps us with that. The first place is we understand head coverings today is what Paul was talking about. Most of the things in negative burqa use the word veil, not hat or coat. Uh, quite clear in this language. Then he says at the very end that the woman's hair is instead of her covering. So I take this more as a, a cultural expression. The moral principle is a woman must have her hair and dress in a way that distinct, distinctly manifest her uh, submission to her husband and her femininity. And so if she has very short hair that in that culture uh, would um, be kind of letting your freak flag fly, she needed to wear a veil. But I say this because then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, the apostle instructs women how to wear their hair in church. He says, don't adorn your hair with your wealth. Well, if she had a veil on, nobody knew what she had in her hair. So it's obvious when we get now to the pastoral epistles, which take, they distinguish between what is descriptive of certain periods in church history and what is pre, uh, 
prescriptive. And so here now, by comparing scripture with scripture, we see it's obvious not a requirement that uh, women uh, wear a veil in church because she cannot wear her jewelry in her hair. So comparing scripture with scripture is the way that we can, I think, the harder questions like that. I, I don't know that it was a positive law. I think it was more of a moral principle that you must manifest your position uh, to your husband, the elders, by how you dress. The moral principle is the uh, demeanor, the dress, um, and the way it worked out at Corinth was that uh, you women who are appearing too masculine need to um, uh, wear a veil. But your hair is instead of a veil. So if you have whatever in that culture is feminine hair, which will vary then from place to place, uh, as long as you are appearing uh, in, a, in a way that you're not by your dress declaring some kind of authoritative equality uh, with your husband or with the elders. Uh, that, that's the issue. But that's a bit different from positive law. Basically, there's more information about the identity of the act in relation back to the principles. Yeah. It's clear the food laws. Uh, the clothing laws, all those laws uh, were positive. And I mean, the New Testament clearly uh, shows us the moral principle in them. For example, you don't plow with a, uh, a donkey and, a, and an ox. It qualifies that to don't be unequally yoked, either in your business dealings or in your marriage relationship. Um, you don't know, muzzle an ox wise threshing applies that to the labor is worthy is hard. So there's moral principles even in those laws, but the laws themselves are not uh, a reflection of God's moral nature, but his will for the church at that particular time is a parent's will for her, his or her children to change as they grow older. Okay. Just like as a hand of Abram. I was going back to the immortality. So, uh -huh. how would you like explain that in the passage where God forbids him from being the tree of life, which is where you go? Well, the immortality soul is the soul is uh, indestructible. That's a hell term. So, the body is not indestructible. The body receives its uh, indestructibility from union the soul because of death there'll be a separation of soul and body and the body then will die. So that was that actually that passage in the past when it says you could you can specifically see there is life. Yes. Well the soul dies, but it's a, it's a it's a death of bondage to sin and the spiritual corruption. But the soul is indestructible. God alone is immortal because he possesses immortality. He made our souls immortal. They can apply the laws. Oh, well, yeah. They can be, exp it can be within a positive law and moral principle, which the Bible draw out for us. Uh, so, even so, a labor worthy is hard is an exposition of the Eighth Commandment. Uh, it was taught to the people in one way uh, by the <coughs> husband and the ox. And so, positive laws could be a way of teaching the moral principle. That's why in Exodus 20 through 23, and then later in Leviticus 18 and 19, you find what is it uh, intermingling, so to speak, of moral and ceremonial and uh, civil or judicial laws. It's because every ceremonial and judicial law grows out of the Ten Commandments and helps us keep the Ten Commandments or its application of the Ten Commandments. But some of those applications are according to the age church, such as the food laws, or the Muslim and the ox wearing mixed garments, whatever. Dr. Fine. Mr. Dotson? The Muslim of the ox, if you were to have a society that was still, uh, like you were a missionary in Africa and they were 
were still obviously harvesting grain and having to thresh it. Would that still apply then on the, on that moral principle or no? I don't know, Zach. I, the moral principles that we are, to, as dominion, we are to care properly for our animals. Uh, but it could be you feed your animal well, and you don't have you muzzle them while he's threshing because you're going to feed them that night. So I think the principle still is the laborer, even if it's a dumb animal, is worthy as hire, but you wouldn't have to necessarily apply it in that manner. Now that's off the top of my head, but I think that makes sense to me. Make sure I won't mention it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait a man and sin and then get you with it. That's two years from now. So <laughs> two and a half years from now. So, I mean, so positive law, so we worshiping God on the first day of the week until the resurrection is uh, return to Christ is not a reflection of God's moral nature, our relationship to Him. It's how God's going to govern us in this age. The um, I believe that, say, the forms of church government or what we do in worship. We do in worship the things God revealed to us, and some of those things are different from the Old Covenant, but we are to do them. It's a sin not to because He revealed them to us, or how the church worships. Um, the, the general principles of how we govern the church, uh, those are uh, more or less positive in that God revealed them to us. In other words, I don't think moral about singing, but because God says, I want you to sing to me, then uh, that becomes a commandment for us. So if you get an insight between the difference between common law and moral law, I think you use more of your time to address which is when does somebody sing in his elitism, like saying that What is legalism? I, by, by accompanying the principle of the law, I would say making something into a law. Is but men mean, cannot do that. See, all God alone is the of the conscience. Right, I mean, but I mean, so somebody would be, in, like, so for example, somebody would impose something to say, oh, the Bible says that women should not, for the Lord's sake, that women should not wear makeup because women cannot wear makeup because that would be adorning themselves. Yeah, but that's not what he says. He says, don't wear your wealth in your hair. He doesn't say don't be attractive. So compare scripture with scripture. And uh, the song of Solomon or whatever, and women are to be as attractive as they can be for their husbands. And uh, so it's ostentation. So positive law cannot be done by the church. We can apply the scriptures. And the church also has an authority to do that. So if your church says, uh, or even the government, the government says you have to wear seatbelts. Uh, they're not buying your conscience on that. They're simply saying as government they have the responsibility uh, in these general areas and it's our duty then to submit. So it's not a moral principle, it's a law. And, and, and government has permission to do certain laws, and the church does as well, in terms of uh, times we're going to meet twice in the Lord's Day for worship. Now, I think there's a moral principle there, but also the church is uh, establishing uh, its life. But the, the positive laws are clearly from the Old Testament in the New Testament place. There's been no doubt find things like, by this he made all foods clean. And the general principle in the ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ and the church. Mark? Uh, 
since the revelation has been ceased, we, we wait a little bit, have new revelations, so can I write to say that there's no more time to be wrong? Yes. You can rightly say that. Uh, Ethan and then Ryan. Me first. I mean, um, Jonathan. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan <laughs> Piper. Would you say there's a danger in some people perhaps treating moral law as if it was a positive law? Uh, say, for instance, woman in church leadership. Someone might argue that that would be unique set of circumstances. Well, they do. Would they undermine moral principles. Perhaps but Paul takes care of that for us. He grounds it in two moral principles: the order of creation uh, and the woman sinned first. So he makes clear in the Revelation it's not a matter of culture. Same with. Uh, Homosexuality. It's quite clear in the Old Testament and in Romans 1 that this is a sexual perversion. So, yeah, there are those who try to do that, but Scripture keeps holding us accountable. Ryan? I'm trying to understand how certain uh, churches, if not all the human service, would, would go about um, defending that position. Basically. Well, I, I can't defend it either, but I, I use that as an example. I think some of them, in good conscience, think they're not required to. Conscious versus positive or moral. Right. They would. Uh, that's purely a matter of inference, and I think the inference is sufficient for it being a service. Okay. And they would think the service is. So it would never be a positive law in that. At that point. But what I was trying to say is, if the church, <laughs> you the church and they have two services, then you've taken vows, and unless you are obviously hindered, you need to be there. And so it's a sin to break those kind of laws as well. But they're not, the positive law is basically the God's revelation for his people at particular stages of the unfolding of revelation. So one of the things I'm sure is this is not holding the evening service, but are you causing your members and your congregants and your members to sin if you're not calling them to evening worship? You know, uh, Come back to that and get to worship. Okay. <laughs> it's almost that great time. <laughs> We've been here an hour and we're still in one. I mean, uh, we'll make it up somehow. <laughs> so that's good. Any other questions then uh, on um, creation of man? Okay. Let's go to Providence at five. So we've, we've, been, we've looked at that organizing question of catechism. <clears throat> One of the four things we know about God is uh, his being, his persons, his decree, and the execution of decrees. So we're now in the execution of decrees, which is creation and prominence. They're put together because they are inseparable. Notice how the confession begins. God the great creator of all things, not uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures, actions, and things. You see the relationship, because he is the creator, he is the owner, the, the uh, possessor and disposer of every single thing uh, in his uh, creation. So it grows out of uh, creation. And it's very important, uh, I think, a distinction but relationship. So, for example, uh, later on we get a framework hypothesis and Klein confuses creation and providence. That's clearly contradictory to scripture and standards. The two distinct acts of God, one that took place in a very discrete period of time, and the other through the age of Christ returns. So, what God did in creation initially, he now does in providence. So, for example, um, granting of, of life in the mother's womb. That in this is a sense an act of creation and that only God can give life in that way. But it's taking place now through ordinary means that God has appointed under that end. He is working through those means. Was there a hand? Okay. I'm on the way. <laughs> uh, you just mentioned that the creation happens in a certain early period. Uh, so my question is, for us who are not uh, Adam and Eve, uh, should we 
we only say that oh, we are our birth is from God's providence. And right. I mean, the language that's what the language is used. I, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and made is one of the words for creation. We recognize we're made by providence, not by a fiat act of creation. Is there any useful distinction uh, we should be making between that rat and stubborn? Because we understand that word. Let's, we'll get into this. Can you say the word again to describe the first this day of creation? The immediate creation of six, six days. It was finished on day seven. He said it's finished. I mean, the, the, the word he was used. Fiat, what is that? we dealt with that last week. the eight commandments in Genesis 1. The words he said that to be in the world. Fiat, F-I-A-T. That's the command of Christ to bring something into existence. So we say by the word of his power. There's eight of those commandments in Genesis 1. We have a very succinct definition of providence. In the Shorter Catechism, God's work of providence are his most wise and powerful, preserving and governing all of his creatures and all their actions. Uh, that's basically uh, what we have in our Catechism 18, except added this phrase we find again and again and again, to his own glory. Everything that God does is always to his own glory. That's in the confession of love to the praise of the glory again of wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. So again, in creation, uh, we see God's uh, power and wisdom and goodness. And in providence, uh, we see these same things and more. So I mentioned before about justice. The, the, the pagans and Paul got uh, bit by the uh, serpent. And they said he's a murderer and he has to die. Uh, they knew justice. Uh, they know that the murderer should die. And he escaped one form. Well, the God's going to get him another form. And so that in providence, there, that conscience and what's written on the heart and what we see taking place in the world around us is to praise of the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. So, uh, the two parts, then, of providence are upholding uh, and sustaining on the one hand, and then governing on the other. Nice little definition of providence in uh, Heidelberg. <clears throat> what does thou mean by the providence of God? The Almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, he upholds and governs heaven, earth, and all creatures, so that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, yea, all things come, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Now, I like the second part of this, as it gets specific for us and helps us understand fully uh, what is meant by all uh, things. So the uh, upholding is the sustaining work of God uh, in providence. Nehemiah uh, 9, 6, you alone are the Lord, you've made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, all that's in it, the sea, and all that's in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you. Or think of Psalm 104, where we have interspersed the order of creation, following pretty much the order of Genesis 1, but interspersed with that, God's providential sustaining of uh, the birds, uh, or the fish, uh, or the animals, or, or the lions, or whatever, uh, through the unfolding of providence there. So, uh, so 
God, the triune God, through the Holy Spirit, was actively causing everything to cohere and to uh, remain as it is according to his good pleasure. So, this desk, your desk, there are molecules and there are uh, natural laws that will explain how they operate, but it's God holds everything, everything together. It's God that makes gravity work. Um, and so we, we talk about natural laws, and I prefer uh, uh, the expression uh, divine habits. Divine habits. Natural laws are another way to describe what our God is doing every second, in every aspect, every place in his creation. So Paul says, in him, we live and move and have our being. So we live in absolute dependence upon him for all things. So yes, it's, we can talk about uh, laws of nature. We can talk about the, the, the heavenly bodies and, and, and such, but nothing operates apart from God's upholding and sustaining power. And it's a great fodder for meditation then to, uh, to think uh, on that. And so he's sustaining you then as well, not just materially, but spiritually. Because redemption is but acts of special providence. So what God is doing in his creation, he's doing particularly for us whom he has redeemed. I know you said that we can't conflate providence and creation, but uh, it seems like. Understand your question. What do you mean, expand beyond the creation? It just seems like it's the the confession seems to deal mostly with providence in its relation to creation. So I'm trying to figure out. Well, actually, we know we get into moral beings here next. Right. I mean, we got just a little bit on general providence, and then we get into uh, providence and sin. Providence in believers and providence in unbelievers and providence in the church. That's what you're asking. I think it's that. All right. Well, come back to me if it's not. And then we've got his governance. And so that uh, he is governing. And when somebody asked about these words, directing, disposing, and governing. Um, it's all just the same way. It's just a way to say comprehensively that God by his providence who's foreordained all that comes to pass is now guaranteeing that all comes to pass according to his foreordination. So providence is kind of the end time reflection of the decree. And in that sense they are the same except the decree is eternal and providence now is the way that God is going to work out his eternal decree. I notice as well that it is all things that God is directing, disposing, and governing. So uh, um, all creatures, all actions, and all things. Very comprehensive, isn't it? So every creature he's made, every action of every creature. So if a lion at you tonight... That would be a creature governed by God's providence, right? And if a tree, a thing, fell on your house in the storm, that would be an action of God's providence. That's what it wants us. There's not a single thing in the entire fabric of the creation that is away from directing, disposing, and governing of God. And remember I mentioned last week when we want to quibble and say, well, but 
what is it to God that I have less hairs on my head than you do? You know all the hairs on my head. Well, it's nothing to God, because with God there is not great and small. He's God, everything else is small. So, yeah, we can have these uh, variations, but everything is part of God's purpose. And we often don't know what all there is according to God's purpose. But uh, that's why it's all things, and all things, great or small, are ordered, uh, governed by God. And then to notice... The subjects of providence, which we've talked about, all creation, animate, inanimate, all actions of creation, all things. So let's just be clear. Can anything happen in this created world in which we live or in the one that we cannot see apart from God's providence? No stray bullets. No cancer cells. No drunk drivers. Okay. You need to... But as we say this comprehensively, we need to notice these attributes, which are very assuring. So it is his holy, wise, and powerful preserving and governing, upholding, directing, disposing, and governing. So God is holy in all that he does. He's wise in all that he does. And he's powerful. And that's why his plans are perfect. Our plans fail either because we're not wise or we're not powerful or we're not either. But because God is wise and powerful, nothing fails. And because he's holy, it's all perfect as he is perfect. So we rest. We rest in him. Now we also have here the ground of God's providence. It's according to his infallible foreknowledge the free and immutable counsel of his own will. We dealt with this uh, in the decree. The foreknowledge of God is that which he's determined to be the end from the beginning because he knew every single possibility and he determined to do it in the way that he's doing it. So foreknowledge is not, I, God saw that a uh, person would do this or that and he let him go. I said, okay, do it. No, the foreknowledge is God's plan. And it's predetermined. And so it's his free, immutable counsel. That's why I said that providence is but the in time outworking of the decree. And there's no dichotomy. There's no tension between decree and providence. And so, of course, it's to the praise of his glory, power, justice, goodness, and mercy. Yes. I wonder why uh, God attributes like uh, goodness and love not mentioned on the confession when uh, he's talking about God's providence. Is it, and this is related to another question, uh, uh, God's providence over those who are not elected, uh, all the things that happen to them in God's providence, when he said that it's uh, out of God's love, no, it's not. Remember, I told you last week that goodness includes God's love. So God's goodness to his elect would also include his love. God's mercy yeah. to his elect is an expression of his love. So just because words are not used doesn't mean the concepts are not, are not there. And for providence, uh, goodness is not even mentioned. What's well, mentioned right here? The praise, the glory of his wisdom, power, justice, goodness, and oh, mercy. Goodness. Better read it ahead of time. John was reading four hours a week. <laughs> Miss Hannah. How would you respond to someone a little un-understanding of God's problems? They don't fear, so they don't fear the final outcome, but they're gripped by fear of the journey. Like, for example, someone who's going to die, and they're not afraid of death, but they're afraid of the pain that they're going to go through. Yeah, I think that that's... Um, we all have to learn to trust God for everything. So what we have to learn to do with respect to providence is God sends me no pain that's not wise, holy, and good. Good for me. Do they freeze up again? They've got no audio. Got no audio. 
Read my lips. Test, test, test. Let each look and I. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for catching that, guys. All right. So the uh, the, the question uh, was uh, a person who doesn't fear the end of providence, but the means. I'm talking about I'm dying, but the pain. You know, there's things we're all afraid of. I mean, I just cannot bear the thought of being paralyzed. I mean, I can bear it, but it's not something that I would appreciate. But what God promises is that with whatever he sends, he gives grace. That's where we rest, because it's wise, good, and holy. So Corey Ten Boom tells a story. She was worried about what she would do under trial, persecution, whatever. And every week she went with her father on the train to uh, Amsterdam because he was the clock maker and the timekeeper. So he kept the town clock and he'd go once a week to make sure it was accurate with the big clock in Amsterdam. And so she was talking to her father. She says, well, he said, uh, when you go with me to Amsterdam, when do I give you your ticket? Right before we get on the train. And that's when God will give us grace. So don't try to imagine what you'd be in this or that situation because you don't know. But what you do know is that whatever God leads you through, His grace is sufficient for you there. And that's how you rest in His providence for the trip as well as the destination. <laughs> it's pretty understandable when we are talking about what Christians are going through the sufferings they are going through, but how do we uh, properly look at the sufferings that non-Christian people have? Uh, how do I understand God's goodness and His mercy? When Let's I come to that chapter. You've not read your chapter this week, I can tell. I read it. Did you read it? You're going to read more carefully. Paragraph 2. All the relation of the foreknowledge and decree of God, the first cause... All things come to pass immutably and infallibly. Now, what's that saying? It's going to change. All right, no change. Exactly as he foreordained it, it is going to come to pass. He is the first cause of everything. It's immutable. He's without error. Yet, by the same providence, he ordereth them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. So what is a second cause? Us. What, Jack? Us. Us. The creation. Gravity, the sun. All the creation. The moon. <coughs> uh, all the different things that are cause and effect that take place in the creation. All the means that are unto all the ends. Uh, in other words, providence does not make us Muslim fatalist. Providence does not absolve us from responsibility. Providence is a safe place to recognize that the things that unfold in my life have come to me by God's good pleasure. But providence never leaves me irresponsible. So the Bible tells me that my days are numbered. So I go out and wander around in the middle of traffic and say, well, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. You know what's going to happen? I'm going to die. And I'm going to die because I was a fool. And I'm going to die because I exercised poor judgment and had bad theology. Uh, it was God's will I died, but... I was the cause of my death. That's the, the relationship here. And we have... You got your hand up? Yeah, or you can finish your sentence. I've, I've forgotten. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Could you define fall out? Uh, yeah, I'm going to. Fall out. In other words, transpire. So here's the decree. Here's God's preserving and governing. But 
What's the event? How do they take place? Your second cause is necessarily, freely, or contingently. So what is a necessary second cause? You could go that, get that like a truce real. if you wanted to, but why don't we just experiment? Jump out the window, and what's going to happen? Oh. You going to fly? You going to float? No. You're going to fall. That is a necessary second means. So anything that is what we call these physical laws, which I call divine habits, uh, these are necessary acts. Ordinarily, how God operates. That's why I tell all you single guys, don't sit around and wait for her to drop out of heaven. You see a godly woman uh, to whom you are attracted, and maybe she's attracted to you, marry her. <laughs> yeah, that's called necessary second causes. You're not going to get married if you stay away from her. And God's not going to drop her into your lap. So necessary. What is a free second cause? Absent or absent. Sir? Absent or absent. On the date. Oh, there we go. <laughs> hey, <laughs> this guy, all right. Uh, ask her out. It's your, your free act for which you are responsible. So we've got our guest here uh, this weekend. It was uh, foreordained that they be here. I hope it's foreordained they study here, but we don't know about that yet. But uh, it is foreordained that they be here these days, uh, but it was their free uh, decision to come. And then contingent causes. I kind of described contingency for you last week. They take place because of something else. Something else, an unplanned for something else. So you didn't mean to fall out the window. You fell out the window and broke your neck. So uh, the second cause was an accident. And Calvin will talk there in the Institute, doesn't he, about, well, you know, from our perspective, we can talk about accidents because you surely didn't plan for this to occur. Uh, so when Alanda got hit three weeks ago, she didn't plan for that to happen. Nor did the guy that hit her plan for it to happen. It wasn't a free act on his part either. Uh, so that would be a contingent second cause. So the three types, and that covers basically any second cause in the entire universe. All right. Now, I love this next paragraph. God in his ordinary providence maketh use of means. So we've talked about second causes, and then we know then because of second causes, we are to use means. Yes, you are to ask her out. You are to uh, get in places where you can uh, meet her. You uh, are to do all kinds of, of wise uh, things in all of life. Uh, you know, if you want to, uh, if you want to lose weight, you don't uh, go eat at McDonald's uh, eight times a week. Uh, you you use uh, means, uh, and normally it's the use of means. So if you want to make wine, what do you do? You grow grapes. Harvest them. Good. <laughs> Harvest them. Squish them under your toes. You put them in. Put it in a barrel. Uh, how did Jesus make wine? You just turn water into wine. Yeah, I don't know how fundamentalists to get around on this one. But anyway, uh, because notice what the steward said at the uh, wedding. The music people serve the best wine after you've had a lot to drink. <laughs> but you, uh, uh, and the, the best wine first, and then the bad wine if you have a lot to drink. But notice, God in his ordinary providence makes use of means. That's, that's normal the way. That's how we live. We, we know what means are, and we are to use them, and we're not to tempt God. But notice, <clears throat> yet is free to work without, above, and against him, at his pleasure, against him, 
Zach, you ready to go? I am, Dr. Five All right, let's take a 10 minute break. So, God is free to work without, above, and against means at his pleasure. So give me a biblical example of God working uh, without means. Well, creation is different from providence. All right, the Red Sea. Uh, I think that would be another category. All right, turning the heart. When the sun stood still in Joshua's time. All right. Resurrection. <coughs> Writing on the wall. Yeah, okay. So obviously a lot of these supernatural acts and miracles were without means. So uh, Christ still in the storm uh, and such. Now, how about above means? This is the one I already gave you. It's the one I already gave you a while ago. Water to wine. Water is in wine, but you have to have water to make wine, but you got to have more than water. So this is above the means by which are Christ anointing people's eyes with mud or spitting on their tongues. Uh, these are above the means. Yeah. All right, now. without means. Yeah. I don't know that there was any means used in that outside of this command. Maybe with the quotation on fish and bread it would be all means. Yeah. Because he had fish and bread. But not enough to speak five thousand men, not counting women and children. Uh, not an example, uh, but the question let's give the example. Are against means. Somebody said it. Axe head. Floating. Just the opposite of what you expect to be starting to do in, uh, in the water. So, um, yeah, we'll get water. Maybe oil and power that never run out of the again means or above means? I would say above means because he did have oil and flour. But all these things you notice are, are providences, but they're extraordinary providences. That we will normally call miracles. miracles. But I want to refine your vocabulary. <clears throat> a miracle is a supernatural providence through the agency of a person. But we could have done other supernatural things, such as uh, not being burned up in a fire or at my line. Those were both uh, against means. They weren't miracles. Because they were not performed through human agency. You see, miracles in the Bible are always uh, signatory. They have uh, sign propensities. And you find those three terms used together. Uh, signs, wonders, and miracles. So Moses in Egypt. Um, and there's only three epics of biblical history, history of redemption, where there were miracles. And that is Moses and Joshua, and Elijah and Elisha, and Christ and the apostles. So what's unique about those three eras, or those six people? They introduced a new epic of, of revelation. So Moses and Joshua, and then that, the law, Elijah and Elisha, the prophet, and then Christ and the apostles, the new covenant. So that's one of the arguments that we've kind of touched on this before, is that why miracles have ceased. But we have to be careful uh, as Reformed people how we state that argument, because supernatural has not ceased. I've seen doctors open up a man and they were convinced that he had cancer from every test imaginable in his lungs were clear. So he prayed for him, anointed him with oil. And I believe that God removed the cancer. Uh, that wasn't a miracle. It was an extraordinary problem. 
God still does these things, and we must live in this era of the supernatural. That's why we, any answer to prayer, in a sense, is in a, a great act of God, isn't it? Do you think that because the, in common language, the word miracle accompanies something different in the technical sense, we could use the term miracle in the popular sense? Mr. Clay, answer that question for me. Uh, you want to clarify your definition. Precision, precision, precision. We've been throwing around words sloppily for too long, and you cannot divorce words from thinking. So I would prefer not to take up the common parlance of, oh, that was miraculous. Uh, because then you've watered down the significance of the miracle on the one hand, and you have failed to assert that, yes, God, this is an act of God, but it was directly an act of God. It wasn't an act of God needed to a human agency. And because of all the people that are claiming to do miracles. If we were living in a time when nobody was going around claiming to be an apostle and do miracles, uh, that might also be different. But I think it's a matter of liberty. It's not a positive law. <laughs> it's a matter of liberty. Um, but the more precise you are in your language, the better off you and others will be in the long run. Now your question. I think you largely and I thought I would get to miracles. <laughs> I guess my, my more specific question would be with regard to the meaning of grace, um, does God work? That's the best way to phrase this. I guess going back to earlier in class, we discussed like issues like uh, Muslims and dreams. And would this be something you could point to as being an example of that? And, uh, and does God work apart or above his means of grace? Or just really just talking about like physical healing? It's just talking about the normal approaches of providence. The means of grace are always supernatural. Mm -hmm. Because it must be the Holy Spirit right. who takes preaching prayer of bread and wine and water and uh, makes them spiritual real efficacy in our lives okay. now moving into the moral realm paragraph four and this is the uh, providence and evil in four and five and six uh, for the almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God, so here we have again these attributes, so far manifest themselves in its providence, that it extend itself even to the first fall and all other sins of angels and men, and that not by a bare permission, but such as hath joined with it a most wise and powerful bounding, and otherwise ordering and governing of them in a manifold dispensation to his own holy ends. Yet so, as the sinfulness thereof proceedeth only from the creature and not from God, who being most holy and righteous, neither is or can be the author or approver of sin. The larger catechism 19 focuses simply on angels. It's one of the few places that simply focuses on angel. What is God's providence towards angels? The angels, God by his providence permitted some of the angels willfully and irrecoverably, notice that willfully, to fall into sin and damnation, limiting and ordering that and all their sins to his own glory, and established the rest and holiness and happiness, employing them all at his pleasure in the administration of his power, mercy, and justice. So we got a lot here. Um, but the first thing to note is that God does, out of his uh, unsearchable wisdom and goodness, um, order all things, even evil, and the first fall. Actually, the fall of angels, as we have in larger catechism 19, and all the other sins of angels and men. So God decreed the fall, and by his providence now, um, directed its entrance into the angelic realm 
and into the human realm. And whereas BD, you know, I, I think equivocates a little bit here, this is clearly for God's glory because it's through the fall that God is going to bring about the great grace of redemption through God incarnate. It's all one big picture. You can't, uh, you, we don't want to divide it. Uh, but notice that um, it's not by bare permission. We talked about that last week. Bare permission would be God saw that some angels would sin or wanted to sin and he let them. No. Uh, it's not that God saw that somebody was going to do something evil and allowed it. Notice how permission is defined here. I directed this to you last week as well. Joined with it, in other words, with that choice, the angels, and his permission, a, wise, a most wise and powerful bounding and otherwise ordering and governing. So not only, yes, God ordained the fall of Satan and the demons, and they willfully uh, acted against God, and he <clears throat> held them in that action. So he wasn't passive. He, he ordered it, and then he, he governed them, so to speak, held them together, uh, in a sense, guaranteed that they were going to do that, that they wanted uh, to do. In a manifold dispensation of his own holy ends. So that when God decrees and permits by bounding and governing sin, he always has a holy end in view. Never a wicked end. He turns all wickedness in his plan to holiness and to good. I guess we can make an analogy if the surgeon wanted to cut off my leg. Uh, I don't think I'd appreciate that, but he would show me it's for my good that he'd do this evil to my body. Uh, that's a weak analogy. That it's always in his perfect wisdom uh, going to accomplish his glory, his holy ends. But he does so in such a way, the sinfulness therefore proceedeth only from the creatures. Here we get first cause, God has decreed, permitted uh, in a governmental fashion, uh, but it's the second cause who has sinned, and the sin proceeds only from the creature, not from God, who being most holy, uh, and righteous neither is nor can be the author or approver of sin. So when we say God's not the author of sin, he is not the tempter. He didn't put the desire in the heart of Satan, the demons. He didn't put the desire in the heart of Adam. Uh, nor does he approve sin as sin. But he orders sin to accomplish his grand holy purposes. Lucas. So when he says That's coming up in the next paragraph. <laughs> Would this be kind of parallel to what you were talking about in creation, where in Genesis 1, God created everything, and then in the rest of the week, he's forming? Like in terms of he doesn't create evil, but he is directing or governing it? Yeah, but that, he's doing more than directing and governing <clears throat> creation. So no, it's not really. But that's get the first cause, second cause thing. So second causes necessarily freely are contingent. So these are free second causes. He's the first cause, but it's the free second cause who has entered into sin and has willfully and irreparably, irreparably sinned. But he is ordering it for his good purpose. So what's Joseph's confession to his brothers? He didn't let them off the hook. He meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God ordained it. Our, when you're talking to your friends who stumble here, I think I've already said this to you, take them to Acts 2, 22 and 23. What is the most wretched sin ever performed by human beings? The murder of Christ. 
So what does Peter say? Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst. This is yourself. Know this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. You see the blending here. Uh, that God foreordained it. They were godless and thus accountable for what they've done. Say, Philip. Isn't God's incomprehensibility? Uh, we sometimes attach the concept of evil in actions itself. But can I say, or may I say, that an action is not evil on itself, such as killing, for instance. I can kill in self-defense to protect my family, and I can kill to murder. So the motivation behind the action characterizes that action as evil or good. So, what we call evil, God intended for good, which is the supreme good, which is in glory. There's a doctrine called concurrence. I put it in the word last week, and um, I have a paper on it. Doctrine of concurrence. Some of the people go to this this direction that uh, if you've got a uh, a musical instrument out of tune, it's not the player's fault music sounds bad. It's the instrument's fault. So they say that God, and then we use analogies like that. Um, um, you mentioned the incomprehensibility of God because our analogy is always going to lack something. But no, that, that, what, they, what they'll say is, is that uh, uh, the act of killing is not an immoral act, but the man that did it made it an immoral act. But God is the one that ordained it. But then he gets got off the hook. And I don't want to get God off the hook. But he's off the hook in these two ways. He's not the author of sin and he's not the approver of sin. It's always, he's a divine alchemist. It's always going to work for the very good. Somebody up there in Never Never Land. I was just asking, can you give examples of theologians that have this errant view of uh, concurrence? Oh, uh, I... I'd have to go look at which ones. I think it's, I don't think it's errant necessarily. I just think it's a bit more stated. Um, I mean, Dabney would, have okay. opposed, Dabney would have opposed it, but I would think that uh, uh, Bob Inc., uh, Sproul, Calvin to a degree, uh, would uh, go more. I, I think the confession, when it says by his bounding and the governing, guaranteeing the end, is pretty close to concurrence. Isn't Gerardo's work basically a work in defense of concurrence over some sort of rigid determinism? No, I don't know. Ask Dr. Wilborn. But I should read it. His work on free will? After class. His work on will? Oh, and uh, Professor Cook said hello, Dr. Fine. Well, tell him hello. Where is he? Between uh, my going to the chess club and my returning, my phone rang and it was him. Doesn't he know you're in class? <laughs> <laughs> he did not, actually, so that was good. <laughs> All right. So, uh, any questions here? Lucas and then Hannah? It would seem like the big thing that we're just touching on is Right. Um, so it's fair to say that God, if God hadn't been limiting sin in the world, sin would be off a lot worse than what it is now. That's true too. Remember that. Hannah? Can you talk a little bit about how this concept of like prayer life and just kind of playing according to the will of God, but God does not approve of evil, so we can be called evil, but God also in his will. Uses evil things to accomplish his will. We only pray according to God's revealed will. That's very simple. We never try to figure out God's decreed will and pray accordingly. So we pray that God will uh, uh, do.
do all, all the things we're taught to pray for in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and we know that his will will be done, and he eventually will do those things. Take, take for example, Paul asked the Romans to pray that he would be delivered from those that wanted to kill him and bring him to Rome. Now, God did that. But he did that through sinful means. So Paul was arrested, thus protected, but unjustly arrested, unjustly tried, unjustly sent on a ship to Rome and held there for two years as a prisoner. But because of that, he had access to a whole segment of Roman population that the gospel he never would have had if he'd gone there as a free man. So uh, he's, that's a good example. In fact, the Acts is a very good example of the interaction of uh, divine sovereignty and providence. So we talk about God limiting evil and sin, and we see an example of that in the Genesis 11 Tower of Babel. Um, but before that, does the flood happen because God did not limit sin? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yes, sir. I could provide an explanation, only you would know if it were adequate. <laughs> sure. I mean, Does it say, if it satisfies you, uh, there is a, um, it, it's one of those things that uh, God has not directly revealed, but what we know a bit, what I know about God, this is my explanation, and it's called the broom handle explanation. Um, so that um, if I had a perfectly oval broom handle right here, not a broom, just a broom handle, as long as I'm holding it, it's going to do what? Huh? Stay upright. Stay upright. What's going to happen? It's going to fall. All finite creatures, physically and spiritually, must be sustained always. So what God did with the angels that fell and with Adam and Eve was he didn't give them, he was under no obligation to do so, the grace for them to maintain uh, their uprightness. Gabby will use the same concept. He uses it with the candle. He says uh, if, you, uh, if you light a candle, all you have to do is leave one and go out. That's the same thing. Is that adequate? I think so. Okay, well, the explanation I heard before was Jonathan, I think Jonathan Edwards, I think John Piper was explaining to Jonathan Edwards, saying that um, God would have shielded his glory, which was sustaining man in, you know. Which that's similar, although I'm not sure they would have recognized they were being shielded by glory, but grace, sustaining grace. We're going to now go to uh, what uh, Luke is going to talk about. No, that's the next one. This is now providence and sin in us. The most wise, righteous, and gracious God doth oftentimes leave for a season his own children to manifold temptations and the corruption of their own hearts. I'm sure that that's been the experience, right? It's really been mine. At times, God exposes us to uh, temptations and the flare-up of corruptions of our hearts, and we sin. Why? Why does God do that? For a number of reasons. To chastise them for their former sins, or to discover unto them the hidden strength of corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts, that they may be humble, and to raise them up to a more close and constant dependence for their support upon himself, and to make them more watchful against all future occasions of sin, and for sundry other just and holy ends. So what are some of the reasons then that God will leave us to go over into sin, sometimes serious sin? To humble, to chastise, to show our dependence, and other sundry holy ends. 
Uh, but because of this, you know the promise, all things work together for good for those that love God and call to finish the finished Does all things include my sin and your sin? Yes. Yes. Uh, David's sin? Yes, it was miserable. But it all was working uh, to his good, and ours will work to our good. And we don't sin to let God's grace abound. Scripture is very clear about that. But we're coming out of the sin, uh, we can recognize that God's going to all, also is going to use this in our lives. Yeah? I have a question. So, uh, over a situation, like, say, for example, somebody that church discipline ministry is like, and then they came back to the church. Like, how do you talk to that person about uh, assurance of salvation, considering that God allowed it? So, their, their concern is if we needed the verse, they went out from us, sure that they're never among us. So, but the excommunicate who comes back is not out from long to show them who among us. Right, but after he went back, yeah. he struggled with assurance of salvation. Like, how would I know that when, like, I fell before because, um, and, and we well, take him to this paragraph. Now you must be dependent and watchful, but God has forgiven your sins, and he wants you to know he's forgiven your sins. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. And the elders have readmitted you to the Lord's table, and that is an act of God uh, who is admitting you to, to the table. So go to the table and seek assurance, and seek grace not to do it again. So to be humble and chastened and to recognize my dependence and this to use grace and to watch my heart are all good things. So I won't be presumptive, but I may have assurance. When it happened the first time, like you responded like when it happened to me the first time, and I thought that I was doing all those things, and then I felt, you know, I fell away from But obviously he wasn't watching his heart. And I thought he was. Playing with sin, playing with temptation. Usually, it doesn't start here, it starts back here. And this is where you got to cut it off. So it's a very comforting uh, paragraph, very realistic. Uh, so we don't sin on purpose, but we know that uh, God will, in His providence, allow us to fall in times into serious sin. For his holy work in our lives and his own glory. Then, Dr. Michael? Yes, sir. Uh, just a question. Sorry, this is David Vogel from uh, Neverland. Hi, um, David. Thinking about, thinking about this paragraph here, um, with God moving it sometimes to see the greater temptation, um, squaring that then with verses like in 1 Corinthians 10 13, you know, no temptation by the way of the gate, that sort of thing. Should we understand this to mean, you know, if we are in the temptation, that, you know, if we were to call out to God for help, you know, still he will assist, yet he just may allow it to press harder upon us in certain seasons? Is that, am I understanding correctly? Well, yes, he will, um, if you don't seek the grace, he's not going to force it on you. So, <laughs> if you're deliberately not seeking the promise and wrestling with the temptation, uh, then you're in a dangerous way. But the promise is sure. Just as the promise is sure that because we're in Christ, we don't have to sin. We reckon ourselves dead to sin. But uh, we none of us reckon ourselves dead to sin in the process of temptation, and we don't always uh, flee to God for deliverance in the temptation. If we did, then he would protect us. Okay? All right, now, sin and the unbeliever. As for those wicked and ungodly men whom God as a righteous judge for former sins doth blind and harden from them he not only withholdeth his grace whereby they might have been enlightened in their understandings and wrought upon in their hearts, but sometimes also withholdeth the gifts which they had and exposes them to such objects as their corruption makes occasion of sin, and withal gives them over to their own lust, the temptations of the world, and the power of Satan, whereby it comes to pass they harden themselves, even under those means which God uses for the softening 
uh, others. So here we're taught God does on his side confirm people in their sin. God does harden people in their sin. He gives them over to a blind and hardened heart. Romans 1, 24, 26, 28, 11, 7, and 8, 9, 15 to 18, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11, and 12. It's, it's punishment. Um, he withholds grace. So we talk, I guess Luke has talked about this restraining of God. Will he take away his restraining hand? Um, no person is ever as evil as he could be in this life. God will uh, allow some to go much further into corruption, such as uh, a man like Hitler or Assad or others uh, like that. And the very things that should have enlightened them and <coughs> worked in their hearts, God re removes those things. And so that the, what, will, what would be grace becomes for them a further hardening. So the gospel message is a savor of life to some, a savor of death to others. Takes away their gifts, and uh, we think of Saul, and we can think of people in history that have just become more and more blind and inept and unable to um, uh, even do that which they uh, should be doing. Uh, and exposes them to such objects as both their corrupt nature and the world and Satan can fasten upon those things and um, give them over to further corruption, give them completely over to sin. So that's God's hardening, and then they harden themselves, and it's a, it's a two-way street. You can see this with Pharaoh. So it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and God hardened Pharaoh harden themselves under the very means that should be for their repentance. But they harden themselves. This too is a part of the work of God's just providence. The beginning to punish wicked in this life with further sin and corruption. Lucas, now you want to ask some questions. I know this is where you wanted to go twice already, so. It's great. I love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're always good for a question, Mark. You're so shy. Uh, that was just a very deep sense. Um, um, so for non-Christians, um, when, when God hardened them or when they, are, they hardened themselves, um, how does God's mercy God's providence always leads to non Christians. Why should they be a recipient of honor? Why should they be a recipient of mercy or goodness? This is judicial. There's no mercy or goodness. Well, outside the fact that he's restrained. And so uh, no wicked person gets all he deserves in this life. He will in eternity. But, and some actually live very happy lives now. So again, there's, we say there's a pattern. This takes place. But it's not goodness and mercy. It's long-suffering, uh, patience. Uh, and, but God will, says in Romans 9, he's patient in order that he might demonstrate his mercy to his elect. And that uh, whatever benevolence comes to the wicked in this life will be further fuel for their damnation. They just harden themselves up. And also because of their um, gratitude. Because they will never lose credit for, for whatever they right. do. Yeah. But that was a good question. No, there's no. Um, why do bad things happen to good people? Probably good. No, That's the wrong question, you see. Yeah. Why do good things happen to bad people? Nobody in this life, converted or unconverted, has ever received in this life just recompense for their sins. And there are great mysteries. So let's say 
best case scenario, a child is born in a covered household, severely handicapped, and uh, lies in a crib for 10 years at the development of a six month old. If God intended that to happen, yes. is it good and merciful? God good and merciful to those parents? Yes. And you got to do that by faith. And they're the ones that can testify so often to what God has done in their lives uh, through those. Uh, How do we comfort those non-Christians who are in great suffering? We comfort them by saying, you know, you're not getting half what you deserve. Hell's going to be worse. But look, let me tell you the good news. And that is, if you'll flee from your sin, take hold of Jesus Christ. God will save you from your sin. He might not save you from these immediate trials, but he will make you his child. He'll bless your trials to you. They'll no longer be a punishment. If they don't believe in the gospel, then there is no other way to come forward. You said, what do we know? Well, not really. How, why? It would be a lie, wouldn't it? Right. God loves you. That's a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> no way. Uh, so, we want to be compassionate, but you can, the only compassion for an unconverted person who is in misery is the point of the cross. Nothing else is compassion, is it? Offer them false hope. A little get better, it's only going to get worse. Okay? And then the last little paragraph is so sweet. As the providence of God doth in general reach to all creatures, so after a most special manner, it taketh care of his church and disposeth all things to the good thereof. So as God is working out all things in the world, everything is for the sake of his church. You, the hurricane, uh, all kinds of ramifications in God's providence of the hurricane, but God do this above all for his church moving everything forward to uh, the climax and so everything in providence is for the well-being of God's people judgment begins in the household of God so there's chastening involved but there's great deliverance and mercies involved the body of Christ is manifesting uh, all kinds of glorious uh, activity so it's a wonderful realization that uh, Christ, the mediatorial king, is directing everything for the advance of his kingdom. Always. Just a minute. Um, I have a question about, particularly about Christ's office. I said to work out at a national level, and I'm thinking of such things as the very common uh, state of the nerve is nerve doesn't do well. And so you will find that nations as well. It applies to Pharaoh and Egypt. Well, that's exactly what's going on. God's given them over to a reprobate spirit. Let's take concrete. For any sane person to say that uh, I'm a woman, but I really want to be a man, or I want to have a homosexual or lesbian relationship is contrary to nature. What gave them over to a depraved spirit? <clears throat> what gave our culture over to say that uh, two men may marry or two women may marry and now may adopt children? What gave a people over to slaughtering 60 million unborn babies? And then you listen to these uh, idiot politicians and see how blind they are about moral issues. And you see that God has given a, a stupor, a spirit of blindness to our leaders. And obviously we're going to make laws then that are against God. And God is giving our, our, our countries over to a, uh, a spiritual stupor. So we pray then for revival and reformation and awakening. 
But you're right. I mean, but that isn't God's providence. There's not a, a rebellion going on today against the gospel or truth or righteousness that is not part of God's plan. Back, somebody up there. Did you just use mediatorial king to refer to Christ? I did, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, I, so as a good RP, actually just because I'm curious, can you define how you see that quickly? Just I want to take a note of it because we're having issues about how it's defined. So I want to know how. Dr. Yeah, well, I'm very much opposed to two kingdom. I think that Christ as the mediatorial king is king over every single inch of every single thing entirety of this universe and is directing all things, paragraph 7, Ephesians 1, the last few verses, uh, to the advance of his kingdom, the purpose of his church. Would you say that that is merited on the basis of his atonement? So when he ascends into heaven and presents himself an acceptable and pleasing sacrifice, he's rewarded with that? Or no, that's my last question. Yes, he's rewarded with it because the reward was uh, asking me and I'll give you the nations your inheritance at the most ends of the earth is your possession. And so the world belongs to him and he is directing all things for the gathering of his elect. And I happen to believe there's going to be a grand day when the great majority of the people who live on the face of the earth will be converted. Put that in your I, mind. I agree with you. The latter day glory. That's right. We just need the Jews to be converted. Jews are going to be converted too. So we're in the same pipe pouch, right? <laughs> I, I hope so. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go to the fall of man, of sin, and the punishment thereof, which is this natural... Uh, Sequoia now from uh, where we have been. Oh, by the way, while I'm thinking about it, there is there needs to be a, a correction in your syllabus. Lesson uh, five, which should be next week, uh, says um, justification. Uh, no, it says Christ and effectual calling. Um, section 5, lesson 5. It's just Christ the mediator. And you'll notice uh, it did get corrected because all the outline and notes are then in section 6, uh, which is uh, effectual calling, justification, and adoption. So all that we deal with in section five is Christ, or lesson five, Christ the mediator. And so that's going to be um, West Virginia Confession of Faith 8. And uh, then use your harmony to line up the larger catechism and shorter catechism uh, with that. The other error there is you're not reciting 15 to 32. <laughs> you're reciting 15 to 17. So you can recite 15 to 17. And then the next... On populate, the syllabus has been corrected. So if anybody down there has corrected the syllabus on populate, it shows that you did that. It is corrected in populate. Yeah, the one I'm looking at right now is corrected. I knew I'd done it. <laughs> this wasn't... I didn't go to populate. That's what I should have done. Okay, well, good. No, I don't need to correct you. I just thought I made a mistake. All right, section four, lesson four, chapter six, seven, and then nine. I, I, I will at least get through the fall tonight. So this classic definition of sin uh, is sort of catechism 14. What is sin? correct this better, right? So we're in unison. Okay. The larger catechism adds one thing, the law of God given as a rule to the reasonable creature. All right. So we have to establish what sin is before we can talk about the fall. 
our first parents being seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. Notice that uh, the confession is not trying to go behind the curtains. Uh, tell us what we do know, and that is that they were seduced by the subtlety and temptation of Satan. Sin in eating the forbidden fruit. This their sin, God was pleased, according to his wise and holy counsel, to permit, having purpose to order it to his own glory. So, the fact is that the man fell because he was tempted and seduced. We know that he was left to the freedom of his own will, and we will come back to that when we get to the covenant of works. Um, and the source of temptation was Satan. But notice in the relationship to God that uh, God was pleased for this to happen. His holy and wise counsel, that's the same as his decree, purpose to order it to his own glory. And then, of course, at the end of the day, is this glory of God is so manifested in the incarnation, the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A larger catechism 21. Did man continue in that state wherein God had first created him? Our first parents being left to the freedom of their own will through the temptation of Satan transgress the commandment of God in eating the forbidden fruit and thereby fell from their state of innocency where they were created. And the shorter catechism 13 and 15 cover that. Our first parents being left to the freedom of their own will. So we're, going to, we're not going to get to it tonight. We would in a normal life. But uh, uh, this freedom of their will, God made them with a free will that was mutable. And that's why even here we're anticipating what's going to be said there. Uh, they fell from the estate wherein they were created. They sinned against God. And what was that sin? Eating the forbidden fruit. And we'll come back to that when we get to, uh, to the covenant go on to look at the result of their sin. Uh, by this sin, <clears throat> that's the wrong one. I never did bring up y'all's notes tonight, did I? I wouldn't have had to print them off if I'd done that. Oh, well, it's too late now. Uh, you got them. So, by this sin, they, that's our first parents, fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and so became dead in sin, and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body. So they fell from the original righteousness. They were right with God. They walked rightly with God, and they had communion with God because they were right with God. And they fell from that, and as a result became dead in sin. So God said, the day that you eat, you shall die. And the principal death there was spiritual death. So they were dead in sin, which means they were wholly defiled in all parts and faculties of soul and body. Now we're describing Adam and Eve. What happened to them? Um, so, into what a state of the fall bring mankind is the transition now in larger catechism 23. The fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. And so now we move um, into the uh, confession in terms of how uh, this uh, happened through the fall of Adam and Eve. This is in paragraphs 3, 4, and 5. And a little bit of ambiguity here. Now, three, they being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed. And the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generations. So here we, the confession was kind of equal opportunity employer, and they put Eve into the mix at this point. 
And I think the reason is, as we work our way through this, what you're going to see is, is that there's two... Um, guilt comes through imputation out of this federal head. Corruption comes, in a sense, inherited, passing from our first parents down to us. Corruption cannot be imputed. And so, uh, Catechism 22, did all mankind fall in that first transgression? The covenant being made with Adam as a public person, not for himself only, but for his posterity, all mankind descending from him by ordinary generation sinned in him and fell with him in that first transgression. Basically the same thing is said in the Shorter Catechism 16. Now why uh, do they add uh, the phrase here, uh, descending from him by ordinary generation? Christ. Christ. Born of the Virgin. This is, we'll get to that next week. It's very, very important. So Adam is the source of the race, and of course you had to have a wife to be the source of the race, so it puts them there. Uh, physically, Adam with Eve is the source of the race. Federally, Adam then is the covenant head. She's not. He is the covenant head, and it's through Adam that guilt is imputed. Romans 5, 12 through 19, uh, and then large catechism 25. which the simplest of that estate where man fell consisted in the guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of that righteousness wherein he was created, and the corruption of his nature whereby he is utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite unto all that is spiritually good and wholly inclined to all evil. And that continually, which is commonly called original sin, from which do proceed all actual transgressions. Confession for from this original corruption whereby we're utterly indisposed, disabled, and made opposite to all good and only inclined to all evil do proceed all actual transgressions. <coughs> and shorter catechism 18, wherein consists the sinfulness of our states, very similar to larger catechism, the one original righteousness, the guilt of Adam's first sin, the one original righteousness, the corruption of the whole nature, which is commonly called original sin together with all actual transgressions that come from it. So what we have here is that because Adam was the federal head, the guilt of his sin, of that one sin, not any other sin, the guilt of that covenant breaking, as he was our covenant head, uh, was imputed then to all his descendants. In the same way, to help you grasp this, is that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to all his elect for whom he acted. Now, some people, wait, we'll talk about the covenant works next week, so I, I won't jump into that uh, right now. So, punishment then is imputed because of guilt. But corruption is inherited. I think that's why um, we have this statement then, they being the root of all mankind, and in short, a larger catechism 26, Original sin is conveyed from our first parents unto their posterity by natural generation, so as all that proceed from them in that way are conceived and born from sin. So in two ways, our guilt comes federally from Adam, and because we're federally in Adam, God justly now causes through uh, the generations uh, our uh, corruption to come to us as well. Joshua. So... I, I struggle with, with, with the way the, the confession words it because whenever we read Calvin, Calvin talks about how unfaithfulness was the root of the fall. Adam and Eve sort of ceased to have faith in what God had given them law-wise. How is that not really the first, how is that not the descent, the, the, the fact that they yeah, it's, trust it's, God? It's difficult. Um, the overt sin was breaking the covenant, and that was eating the forbidden fruit. Okay. And so, yes, because the scripture doesn't go behind the scenes on that. We, we recognize uh, that um, lust was born in Eve's heart, but Adam simply ate the forbidden fruit. So, yes, you can't, you can't divorce 
the unity of a simple act. So obviously unbelief was entailed in the eating, but the overt transgression of the covenant was eating the forbidden fruit. Okay. So the covenant of life and covenant of the dominion unity of the Adam and Ask that next week, okay? You don't impute corruption. In the same way, this is where the Romans are wrong. You don't uh, impute justification uh, or uh, sanctification. I mean. You impute justification. They want to have infused righteousness to come through sanctification. No, that, that doesn't come that way. That comes through a union, a, a living union with the Holy Spirit, whereas our corruption comes through a union with our corrupt ancestors. Corruption is not imputed. Guilt is imputed. Guilt is inherited. Every body descended from by ordinary generation born dead in their sins and trespasses, so they're guilty, but they also have inherited from their parents a corrupt nature. So it's in a way of uh, biological. Uh, it's by way of spiritual appointment. And all those that proceed from Adam and Eve to ordinary generation. Uh, participate in the corruption of the sinful nature. Because the soul is corrupt. And again, that's a mystery. They say this to me. But the soul is corrupt, which means that all that spiritually comes from the soul is corrupt. So what does that mean, the corruption then? It's unable to do good, disposed to do evil, Utterly indisposed, disabled, made opposite all good, is how it states it. And then to commit actual transgressions. So this is what we call total depravity. Total depravity does not mean that anybody is as sinful as he could be. But it means that utterly indisposed, disabled, made opposite to all good in the entirety of our being. There's not one aspect of us as people that is not corrupted by sin. A uh, uh, short catechism 18 is, just, is really a beautiful definition of original sin. The guilt of Adam's first sin, the want of original righteousness, so that's what we lost along with holiness and knowledge, and the corruption of nature. So all of that is ours through the fall, and that's why it's called original sin. We're born in this condition. Together with all actual transgressions that proceed from it. So that sin is disposition as well as action. But it all comes from a corrupt heart. Now next the confession deals with sin in the believer. This corruption of nature, paragraph 5, during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and all the motions thereof are truly and properly sin. So your own experience testifies to this. You are regenerated, you are pardoned, and you are dying to sin and increasingly being conformed to the image of Christ. Um, and yet, um, the motions that come from your heart are truly and properly sin. Anything that's contrary indisposition or act, transgression or want of with respect to uh, God's law. Now paragraph six, yes. Well, as I said earlier, the image of God is greatly defaced. So although we are, we have intelligence and will and affections, all three of those are affected by our depravity. And so, um, and the more God gives us over to our depravity, then the worse we become. But we're still image bearers, and that makes us all the more guilty. Because we're willfully choosing to sin and to reject God. And I'm proud. So for 
right? Don't they call it totally depraved? Or, or am I understanding that? Yes, totally depraved means that every aspect of your nature is corrupted. Does that mean uh, in any area you're as bad as you could be? Okay. G.I. Weeks used the illustration. Um, if you want to make a glass of poisonous water, do you need to fill it full of poison, or do you need to have a glass of water for a few drops of poison? And so we've had the poison of corruption into our nature. It's not 100% corrupt. Satan is, the demons are, but we're not. But then the hardening has God given us more and more over to our corruption and our sins. So there's a difference between a complete or a holy depraved. Yeah, total simply means every faculty. So that's why I take knowledge, volition, and affection. Conscience, every aspect of our being is corrupt, and only corruption will come from it. So we're unwilling and unable to turn to God or to please Him. That means it's, we're holy. What's the language? We're holy, indisposed, unable to do good, and disposed to do evil. Utterly indisposed, disabled, made opposite of all good. Dr. Hyatt. Un momento. I've heard the distinction made between total depravity and utter depravity or utterly depraved. Is that a proper uh, distinction of terms? Probably. And, I think that's what the total depravity is. In all parts. All of, and all of, all of parts. All yeah. and utterly as, as, as sinful as, right. as possible. Right. And hell will be utterly depraved. Devil and demons are utterly depraved. But man is not yet utterly depraved. Yes, sir. Uh, so obviously there are people who are unbelievers who behave in ways that would be, at least by, to appearance, good following the moral Let's wait till we get to the uh, chapter on, on good works. I'm sorry? Wait till we get to the chapter on good works. I'm cut off some rabbit trails. <laughs> All right. Um, punishment then um, for sin. Paragraph 6. Every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God, and contrary thereunto in its own nature, bring guilt upon the sinner. So we got the guilt of Adam's first sin, but now every sin, original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God, and contrary thereunto in its own nature, bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he's bound over to the wrath of God and the curse of the law and made subject to death with all the miseries of spirit. So we're now getting to the punishment of sin. We all are guilty in God's sight, no longer simply for Adam's sin, but for our own sin. And that means we're under the wrath of God. So the Catechism speaks of the uh, misery fall brought mankind in a state of sin. We got it! <laughs> test, test, test. Okay. Good. Well, we're having trouble uh, he told me before class. Um, so the fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. So the sin, then, that we're brought into is uh, this uh, sin that's been described. And then, uh, short of Catechism 19, what is the misery of that estate where the man fell? All mankind by their fall lost communion with God, so that Adam did, now we do, are under his wrath and curse. And so made liable to all miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Larger Catechism 27, the fall brought upon mankind the loss of communion with God. So we're dead, we have no communion with God. His displeasure and curse. As we are by nature, he quotes Ephesians 2, children of wrath, we're bond slaves to Satan, and we're justly liable to all punishments in this world and that which is to come. So here we are faced with the reality of the condition of every human being under the curse, under the wrath of God, the curse of the law, bondage to Satan is added in Roger Catechism 27. 
subject to death spiritually, temporally, and eternally. We talked about the spiritual death, loss of communion, corruption, uh, lying to God. Of course, temporally, we're all going to die until Christ returns. And then eternal death, the eternal uh, damnation. Subject to all miseries. So again, we get back to the, the uh, wicked who are suffering. Their, their suffering is punishment of sin. All suffering is a reality of sin. So any suffering you and I go through, it might not be for our personal sin, but it is because of sin in the world. And God will chasten you and me for personal sins, and there will always be a close relationship to the chastening and the sin. I'm not going to take a rocket scientist to figure it out. Otherwise, God has multiple purposes in our trials. We need to seek his purposes and seek his grace and such. But uh, all the miseries of this life, so when you ladies have babies, remember what Eve did to you and why you're having so much trouble in your pregnancy and in having that baby. Um, that is one of the miseries of this life. Hannah. Yeah. Well, we, a purgatory prayer doesn't put a person in hell, uh, but it asks God to judge his and our enemies. So I pray, uh, for when I pray about different countries and dictators and whatever, I pray, God, if you're not going to convert them, destroy them. I pray for abortions. God, if you're not going to change them, close their wounds. Give them the consequences of, uh, of their sin. Uh, so we're asking God's curse on the wicked. Um, if we do that generally, we don't have to, but if we plan particularly, we can always couch it with Lord, if you're not going to convert them, judge them. I thought there were other hands. Justin? Do you believe that a preparatory prayer should be used sparingly by the believer? What's sparingly? So, from what I've heard in the conversations that I've had with pastors in regards to this, um, they say we can Well, and first, the predatory prayers are not necessarily praying for their damnation, it's praying for their judgment in this life. And it might be that very judgment in this life that God would convert them. So when I pray the predatory prayers, I'm not asking God to send someone to hell necessarily. I'm asking God to deal with them here according to the acts they're doing against his church. So I don't interpret the predatory prayers as uh, praying that they'll go to hell. I pray that God will judge them. If that includes hell, let it be. But wouldn't praying for the destruction in turn, does, doesn't David pray for the destruction of his enemies? Mm -hmm. And if he, the Lord destroys his enemies, I guess in justice, would that be, I guess, damning them to hell? But he might, in destroying them, temporarily convert them. Step in your foot, they'd be in deep trouble. Yeah. But uh, you have to pray. No, uh, I, I may personally pray in precatory, but it's not because somebody insulted me. I have to pray for my enemies. But I have to pray against these people who set themselves against Christ's church. I pray that God would destroy ISIS because of their shedding the blood of professing Christians and promoting uh, wicked laws. Now, I also pray that God will 
do a great work of conversion amongst the Muslims. But that doesn't stop me from praying that as you cause the plague to break out against the uh, Syrians, and the Assyrians, cause the plague to break out, destroy them. If, and I'll say destroy them by the sword, destroy them by the gospel. I pray for China, and I pray that China will just collapse under the gospel, that the whole foundation will rot away because of the working of the leaven of faith. But I am praying for the destruction of wicked regimes, but not because they hurt me, but because of what they're doing to Christ honoring to his church and to my brothers and sisters. You see the difference? That's how I can reconcile in purgatory psalms and praying for my enemies. My enemy in that regard is the guy that has abused me or taken advantage of me or slandered me, um, who thinks of me as an enemy. I'm not playing in precatory psalms against those kind of people, but those who are arch enemies of Christ and the church. In a lot of Christians, I know this is like a big disagreement that I've witnessed within the church at times when uh, regime is being like something like that is being announced. Very famous. And then Saddam was killed, and there were Christians who were like rejoicing over it and, and being very vocal about how wonderful it was that he was killed. And then other Christians were very uncomfortable with that and saying, We shouldn't rejoice over someone's death. How, but you're, so you're, you're praying for judgment. And how is well, I would rejoice to say, Thank you, Christ. Well, I mean, you see it in Revelation. Uh, they rejoice over the destruction of the enemy. I thank you, Christ, for destroying the enemies of your church. I'm not going to be giddy happy about it. But if I pray that God would destroy them, then I need to honor him for doing so. But I don't have to be giddy and jumping around happy. I have to hear a sober voice. Converting or removing. Would Jesus respond the same in this first way? Um, maybe you may have been in English with you. Give an example of a purgatory um, statement. Uh, well, yes. I don't know. It would surely be an apostolic, uh, uh, I mean, it was uh, basically a, a act of discipline in declaring him to be wicked. I don't know that he was beyond conversion at that point. We all right? We're all on the same page? <laughs> Should we pray for both? Pray for their conversion? Yeah, why not? But, I mean, look at the... Are the saints under the altar in Revelation 6 praying for the conversion of the Jews and the Romans persecuting the church? They are? No, they're not. They're praying that God will vindicate the blood of the martyrs and God said, be patient, I'm going to. He didn't say, I'm going to save them. He said, be patient, I'm going to. Now, God will vindicate the blood of the martyrs by converting persecutors. But they were praying for vindication. And I think there you, there you see perfect souls in whom there's no sin praying in precatory uh, prayers. So I think there's sufficient more. We just don't gleefully... We never should rejoice over the damnation of the wicked. We will in some way in heaven and the honor of God. But in this life, I don't think we are to rejoice over the uh, destruction of the wicked, but we are to thank God uh, when he removes them. You see the difference? I think that what gets... Well, we are praying God's will be done on earth in heaven, but that's the precatory psalms too. <laughs> no, I I think it's fine just to pray in a precatory psalm. Even if in our heart we understand, now Lord, if you convert these people, it's great. And at other times we'll pray for their conversion. I'm not saying you even have to couch every prayer always with both, both shoes dropping. 
as long as we're praying biblical prayers. Because the martyrs in, in Revelation were not praying for the conversion of the Roman Empire or the, or the Jews that were killing them. Would it be accurate to say that the precatory prayers are praying for... How did we get into precatory prayers? <laughs> I'm sure this is your <laughs> fault. <laughs> it's not. I, I, I simply bounced off of someone else. Um, but what is... <laughs> For sin, I guess we can talk about it here. <laughs> well, the miseries of this life. <laughs> would, would it be accurate to say that in preparatory prayer is praying for truly God's perfect justice to be, uh, I guess, administered? Uh, and so, really, ultimately. Against the haters and persecutors of the church and dishonorers of Christ. So, Not against your next door neighbor because. Yeah. And so another thing that I have, and maybe this is a distinction that needs to be made, is that the predatory prayer is not meant for an individual. It's meant for a um, a group of people or a. No, I, I prayed for all kinds. I, I remember when Ho Chi Minh was <clears throat> there, and I, I prayed publicly that God would uh, remove him. He was out of office in two weeks. <laughs> 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 I wasn't the only one praying. I'm sure. But uh, you think of these, I mean, Idi Amin, I think of so many individuals that uh, uh, I've prayed that God would remove them from office. I pray that God would convert them. I prayed that for President Obama that God would remove him and convert him, or convert him. I prayed for President Trump that God would uh, preserve him, but convert him. Uh, so, uh, I think we should pray for our leaders that God will convert them. We also, the wicked, uh, and it's if President Trump is, is not a righteous man, but he is a defender of Christ's church. He's a Cyrus. So we need all more to pray both for his uh, conversion and his safety because there's many people. By the way, Fabio, how's the guy, the Trump from Brazil, who got stabbed in the gut? Um, he's getting better, but... He did another another sur surgery, but he's he's not in good shape. He's bad. Like he's, he's getting better, but still bad. Will he be able to campaign again? Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. But that's the kind. Of, I mean, a righteous, even a a non-Christian, but a man promoting righteousness right now is in great danger. We need to pray for their safety. Uh, but I I pray against abortionists. I don't, I don't even know any. But I pray against them, that God would uh, shut them down, that he would close the womb. I pray and pray to close the wombs of their wives and grant them no children. That's a biblical prayer. Um, and raise up righteous laws against them and convert them. I'm all for conversion. <laughs> all right, guys. Are you having fun? I am. It might have to spend two weeks after class to finish and then we'll finish. <laughs> this has been a presentation of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary.